As Cameron has highlighted, Palestinian politics and internal affairs are widely ignored by Western press and policymakers and think tanks that they influence. Palestinians are often treated as props in a crusade against Israel, their internal matters ignored. And I'd argue that in part, we're reaping the fruits of that right now. Khaled's reporting is essential, absolutely essential to the small but mighty number of folks, including myself and my colleagues who write and study Palestinian affairs. So it's a personal pleasure and an honor to have him with us today. A brief note about the format before we begin. We'll begin with my taking the moderator's prerogative and asking several questions, and then we'll turn it over to some questions from the audience. To do so, please go down to the bottom of the screen and click on the Q&A button and type in your questions. Thank you, Khaled, for joining us. Thank you so very much. Friend. We're very much looking forward to, uh, to the talk today. I, I certainly am. So I'd like to begin with a question, um, a kind of a broad overview. How has the recent fighting between Israel and Hamas threatened the Abraham Accords? Well, fortunately for us, we don't see an impact yet. And uh, hopefully we will not see any impact. I haven't seen any powerful reactions from uh, the United Arab Emirates or from uh, Bahrain so far. Uh, although Bahrain, by the way, because of the uh, makeup of its population, uh, has been uh, a bit more vocal in its criticism of Israel over the, uh, uh, the Gaza war. But by and large, uh, I would say that, thank God, these agreements have not been affected. Uh, they are unlikely to be affected. Uh, and there are num a number of reasons why. Uh, you know, relations between the uh, Gulf states uh, uh, or many Arab countries and the Palestinians have been strained, uh, especially in the last uh, year or two. Uh, mostly because of Palestinian attacks on the Arab countries that signed the uh, Abraham Accords with Israel. Uh, we saw last year uh, the Palestinian Authority, Hamas, and many other Palestinians, they came, they came out very strongly against the uh, normalization agreements. Uh, they even accused uh, the Arab countries of betraying the Palestinians, uh, betraying Al-Aqsa, uh, stabbing the Palestinians in the back. These were very serious allegations that, uh, you know, intensified tensions between the Arabs and uh, the Palestinians. Uh, we saw back then a major onslaught, a major attack on the Palestinians coming from the Gulf. Uh, especially on social media, where uh, many, you know, Bahraini, uh, United Arab Emirates, and even Saudis were telling the Palestinians, you guys are ungrateful. We have been giving you money for many years. We have been supporting you. We even made sacrifices for the Palestinians. And when, when we decide, you know, to make peace with Israel, you start attacking us. You start uh, burning our flags. Uh, on the streets of uh, the West Bank. Uh, you start uh, uh, burning the pictures of our leaders at the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Uh, these are very serious things you are doing, so get out of here. Uh, I would also add that in the last week, I've also seen a lot of understanding for Israel's position uh, uh, for coming from many people in the Gulf. Uh, I've seen a lot of attacks on Hamas uh, coming from the Gulf. Uh, you know, you, you, would, you would think that these attacks were coming, or this criticism was coming from Israelis uh, or uh, some Westerners, but to see Palestine, or to, sorry, to see Arabs, Arab Muslims, uh, writing that, you know, Hamas is using Palestinians as human shields. Hamas uh, does not care about the suffering of the Palestinians. Uh, Hamas is a terrorist organization supported by Iran. Uh, why is Hamas firing rockets at Israel? You know, these are Arab voices, and they are very, very strong. Uh, and they're coming from the Gulf states. So as such, I mean, since we are anyway expecting the uh, fighting to end tomorrow with the ceasefire, I think things will go back to normal. But I haven't really seen, uh, you know, as I said before, uh, the relations between Israel and the 
these Arab countries uh, uh, being affected at all so far. And this is good news. You know, these two countries have ambassadors here. Many Israelis uh, continue to visit, uh, uh, you know, the United Arab Emirates and other Gulf states. So, you know, as I said, the almost no damage so far. And that's good news. Good news indeed. Now, is, has there been any bit of a significant difference between, say, what you would see on uh, Emirati social media versus Bahraini? You noted that they're that Bahrain, of course, is a very different composition uh, in terms of uh, Shia and whatnot. Um, has there been a difference that you've, that you've noted between the two or not really? Well, I mean, let's say I've seen less sympathy for Israel uh, among Bahraini social media users. You know, as you mentioned, uh, uh, Bahrain has a large Shia population. Uh, they are affiliated with Iran. Uh, they have been, uh, de- you know, they have been uh, against the, Iran- the Bahraini regime anyway. Many of them were opposed to the uh, Abraham Accords. So it is, it is not really surprising. But again, uh, this has not affected the position of the, uh, of the uh, Bahraini government. Uh, I've also seen other sympathetic uh, voices coming from Bahrain. If you follow the... Uh, the Twitter handle of the president of the Bahrain Journalists Association, Ahdiya, you will see that she posted some very critical remarks about Hamas, denouncing denouncing them as merchants of the Palestinian cause, as uh, uh, you know, uh, destroying Palestinian lives, and as being a terrorist organization. Again, these are very powerful uh, voices coming from the Gulf or from the Arab world. Uh, If you had, you know, told me a few years ago, three or four years ago, that we would hear such criticism coming from the Arab world, I would have told you, I don't think it will ever happen. It's it's pretty amazing. And certainly, I think a a bit of much needed optimism uh, amidst uh, what's been unfolding these last several weeks here. Um, Now, are there any Arab nations who might be thinking of peace agreements with Israel that might be Affect, uh, affected by this conflict, less likely perhaps to, to, to sign on? or You know, uh, I would like to uh, go back to what I was talking about before we move on to your question. And just one more point, which is, if you follow what Hamas Islamic Jihad have been saying in the last uh, week of the fighting with Israel, They're they're saying, look, this is not only about uh, Sheikh Jarrah, the neighborhood in Jerusalem. This is not only about Al-Aqsa Mosque. This is not only about Jerusalem. This is also about fighting normalization with Israel. Uh, Today, the commander of the Quds Force in Iran sent a letter to Hamas in which he said, uh, we will continue, Iran will continue to support Hamas and all those Arabs who sold Palestine, quote unquote, are traitors and they will, uh, you know, be condemned. Uh, he's actually saying, or, or these, these Iran and its proxies are actually saying that one of, their, one of the reasons why they are attacking Israel is also because they want to prevent or they want to foil the peace agreements between Israel and the, uh, the Arab world. Now, will we see other countries uh, join these agreements? I hope so. There was a lot of hope uh, that Saudi Arabia, for example, would move, uh, uh, would you know, follow suit, but nothing is really clear in Saudi Arabia. We don't know uh, if uh, the king has power over or leverage with his son, we don't know how powerful his son is. We, uh, things are really uncertain there. But I think that many people in the Arab world are waiting to see uh, what direction the new U.S. administration will take. Uh, if they feel that this administration will encourage them, will promote peace between Israel and the Arab world will stand by them, uh, will not support Iran, uh, then you will see more Arabs joining. 
But for now, there is a lot of uncertainty in the Arab world with regards to the plans and intentions of the Biden administration. So the Arab countries are just sitting there and waiting, the other countries that might make peace with Israel. Now, when you say other countries, and this is, of course, one of the, the you know, I think perhaps the, the largest uh, question mark is, um, is Saudi Arabia, and you briefly touched upon that. Uh, if you could go into more depth in that and perhaps compare um, how the Saudis have reacted with this Israel-Hamas war versus, say, 2014. Um, is, are their previous statements comparable? Has there been a significant uh, shift in tone? Be interested in your thoughts. Well, first of all, you know, I follow the Arab media, including the Saudi media. And again, I've seen many articles there uh, strongly denouncing Hamas, uh, strongly denouncing the Palestinians in general also. Uh, look, it's not that they have become pro-Israel. But what they are saying, the message they are saying is, we now understand that Israel is not waging war on the Palestinians. It is waging war against a terrorist organization. And the Saudis, like many other people in the Gulf, they see Hamas as being a proxy of Iran. They draw parallels between Hamas and the Houthis in Yemen the Iranian-backed militia that is now attacking Saudi Arabia. They do not distinguish between Hamas and the Iranian-backed Hezbollah in Lebanon, which has destroyed Lebanon, which has taken over Lebanon. Uh, So the Arabs understand the threat of these terrorist organizations. They understand that Iran is using these terrorist organizations to expand its control in the Middle East and to destabilize the Arab world, the Arab countries. Iran is already seen as a major threat to Iraq, to Syria, to Lebanon, and to Yemen. Iran is meddling in the internal affairs of these countries. And that's why the Saudis, like other Arabs, they have no sympathy for Hamas. Talking about Saudi Arabia, by the way, they have arrested more than 60 Hamas officials and leaders. They were arrested two years ago, and many of them are on trial. The main accusation against them is that they tried to raise funds for a terrorist organization. And we're talking about Saudi Arabia. And that's why relations between Hamas and Saudi Arabia are very tense or have been very tense in the last two years. Hamas has been attacking Saudi Arabia, uh, demanding that the Saudi authorities release their leaders, their members, accusing uh, the Saudi authorities of, uh, you know, uh, making making up these charges. You know, they're saying these are uh, fake charges that uh, Saudi Arabia just wants to appease the Americans in the West by cracking down on Hamas. And some would have even gone further uh, or farther by saying that uh, the Saudis are trying to appease Israel, that there's some kind of a rapprochement between Israel and Saudi Arabia. And that's why the Saudis are cracking down on Hamas. So that's, I think that's particularly interesting in the sense that you have uh, some of the Arabic press and say, uh, and I use that term broadly, but be it uh, Saudis or the Emiratis, who actually seem to be able to connect the dots between uh, Hamas, Hezbollah, and the Houthis, which is not really something you see in the U.S. media reports that we deal with, where they're more emphatic about the Sheikh Jarrah narrative and so on. So that, that's an interesting contrast. Um, how would you relate, to what extent is all of this, and I say all this, this Israel-Hamas war, related to not just Iran, of course, these are Iranian proxies, but ongoing negotiations in Vienna. Is this an attempt, as the uh, Quds Force members said the other day, to to, uh, to apply leverage and extract concessions? Uh, look, we don't know if there is a direct link, but there is no doubt uh, among many people here in this region that uh, Iran uses these, uh, its proxies in the Middle East in, uh, as a way of trying to extract concessions from the Westerners, specifically from the Americans. 
because the Iranians want the Americans and the others to, to see how powerful Iran is. They want them to see that Iran, Iran's uh, you know, uh, proxies are very active. And as such, the Iranians believe that you know, the West will make more concessions because they, the West wants quiet. And one, way, and one way to achieve this calm is by appeasing Iran. So this is one theory over here that you know the Iranians are using it uh, but I would add that in his letter to Hamas today the commander of the Quds force he said at the end of the letter and this is very important he said it is very important for us to defeat Israel because when Israel is defeated that is a defeat for the American so Iran has one eye on the conflict over here and the other eye on the Americans. Right. Uh, Iran is basically saying, look, we, I mean, for us, uh, the friend of my enemy is my enemy also. Uh, and, you know, we want to destroy Israel and hopefully we also want to destroy the Americans. Well, I, I hope some people are paying attention to that. Um, can you discuss, and I know this is supposed to be about the Abraham Accords, and uh, the current war. But if you could touch up a bit upon the role of Erdogan's Turkey as well in terms of uh, their recent statements by Erdogan about the, the violence that's been occurring. You know, in recent years, Turkey under President Erdogan has been playing a very negative role in this part of the world. Uh, Turkey has been hosting senior Hamas officials uh, there were some reports that Turkey even gave them some, uh, gave some of the Hamas leaders passports uh, and shelter, uh, much to the dismay of the Palestinian Authority, by the way. Uh, there have also been all these, you know, very fiery anti-Israel, anti-Semitic statements coming out of Erdogan and Turkish officials and the Turkish media. The message coming out of Turkey is, we support Hamas. And if you support Hamas, that means you support the destruction of Israel, because that's Hamas's ideology. That's Hamas's charter. Uh, and that's why the messages are very negative. Ham Turkey has been trying to play some kind of a role in this part of the world, especially in Jerusalem. Uh, but th they're not really accepted because of their support for Hamas and their bias against Israel. Uh, and this has even strained relations between Turkey and some Arab countries. Turkey also plays host to the Muslim Brotherhood, and that's why the Egyptians are unhappy with the Turkey's policies. And in the last month or two, we've seen Turkey trying to restore relations with, the, with Egypt and uh, Erdogan even hinting that he's prepared to kick out the Muslim Brotherhood uh, people in his country and things like that. We've also seen tensions between Turkey and Saudi Arabia over this. Uh, so Turkey's affiliation with and support of Hamas and the Islamists has also disqualified Turkey from playing any uh, effective role or any positive role in this part of the world. And how does, uh, we're talking about current peace agreements, how does Jordan fit into all of this in terms of uh, Jordanian foreign minister was, uh, I guess, putting pressure on Abbas shortly before things blew up here? If you could talk about, uh, about that as well, that would be, that'd be great. You know, Jordan is very worried. I mean, they've always been worried about uh, what, is, uh, what is happening in Jerusalem. They've been worried about the uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict because Jordan is a very special case. Uh, Jordan has a large Palestinian population and uh, the king's biggest fear is that one day these Palestinians will revolt against the king against uh, who represents a minority uh, and may even take over Jordan. Uh, some people in Jordan, you know, some of the, even people close to the king are convinced that uh, there's some kind of a conspiracy out there uh, 
uh, to turn Jordan into a Palestinian state. And that's why uh, Jordan has been pushing for a two-state solution. Uh, Jordan's position, if I were to sum it up, is we love the Palestinians, they're wonderful people, but we want to see them over there, right. not here. We want to see a, an independent Palestinian state, not because we love the Palestinians, but because we don't want to see the Palestinians, we want to get rid of them. Uh, and that's why, you know, Jordan has been coming out also with the Jordanian officials have been coming out with all these fiery statements against Israel. That's also part of an attempt to uh, appease the, the, you know, the street in Jordan. Right. Uh, they, they realize that uh, anti-Israel sentiments are running, have always been running very high. And some of these Jordanian officials, sometimes, you know, they want to uh, toe the line, as we, so to speak. Uh, we've seen very harsh rhetoric come out of Jordan regarding the Al-Aqsa Mosque on the Temple Mount, regarding visits by Jews to these places. I mean, actually Jordan, or the Jordanian government, has been also inciting against Israel. Uh, not only the Palestinian Authority and Hamas. Now, what happens? The Palestinian Authority, Jordan, incite their people against Israel on a daily basis. They keep saying all these awful things about Israel. You know, the Jews want to destroy the Al-Aqsa Mosque. The Jews are desecrating with their filthy feet our holy sites. Uh, the Jews are carrying out ethnic cleansing and genocide, and the Jews uh, uh, are violently storming our holy site. Now, if these are the messages you keep sending to the street in the West Bank or in Jordan, what happens? The people get angry, and they erupt against Israel. Uh, and they also erupt against Jordan and the Palestinian Authority themselves. Right. Why? Because the people there say, well, if these Israelis and these Jews are so bad and they're so awful, why do we still have an Israeli ambassador in Amman? And then they tell Mahmoud Abbas, the Palestinian president, excuse me, if these Jews don't want peace and they just want to kill us and kidnap the children and rape the woman and carry out ethnic cleansing and are doing war crimes, then why are you, Mahmoud Abbas, prepared to return to the negotiating table with them? And why are you conducting security coordination with Israel? So this is, you know, <laughs> this is how it works in the Arab world. I think that, you know, Arab dictators, in order to survive, they always need to keep their people busy hating someone else. And in this case, it's better to incite your people against Israel and keep the people busy hating Israel, because if they're not hating Israel and they're not protesting against Israel, they might come to you, the Arab dictator, knock on your door, and may God forbid, they might demand reform in democracy or even free elections. And that's something you cannot afford. So we saw it with Mahmoud Abbas recently. So I'd, I'd like to... I'd like to follow up on that. Um, so what does this current fighting mean for the future of Fatah? Uh, is a post Abbas, which Abbas is 85, 86. Um, well, you know, what, what's a post Abbas West Bank look like? Is it right for Hamas's taking? Look, were it not for Israel, were it not for Israel's presence in the West Bank, Hamas would have taken over the West Bank a long time ago. They would have eaten Mahmoud Abbas and Fatah for breakfast a long time ago. What is keeping the Palestinian Authority and Fatah in power in the West Bank is Israel. The same Israel, by the way, that they are inciting against on a daily basis. This is, again, an irony. This is how it works here. You incite against Israel during the day, and at night you, you, know, you work with Israel and you even apply for a VIP card, uh, to travel to Israel to receive medical treatment. Uh, this is how it works with the Palestinian Authority. But I can tell you one thing. Mahmoud Abbas's credibility and Fatah's credibility, you know, Fatah is his ruling faction, 
has been severely, severely undermined. Not because of Israel, not because of uh, you know the elections, because of corruption, because of their failure to deliver, because of their lies to the Palestinian public, uh, because of their hypocrisy. And the Palestinian public is not stupid. They see it. When Mahmoud Abbas announced that uh, his decision to delay the elections and accused Israel or held Israel responsible, do you think that most Palestinians bought it? Believe me, more people in the Western media bought Abbas's argument than Palestinians on the street. Because Palestinians know that Mahmoud Abbas was afraid of a Hamas victory. And that's why he, you know, was scared of the elections. That's why he called off the election. Uh, Palestinians know that if Mahmoud Abbas was really serious about holding elections, he could have held them 15 years ago when his term in office expired. But in the last 15 years, he did not care about holding elections and uh, this whole thing was nothing more than a PR, uh, uh, you know, stunt, or I don't know what, what you say, just to uh, appease his European funders and to impress the Biden administration. Right. right. Now, the, the fighting, or what has been happening in recent weeks, has further undermined Abbas's credibility and Fatah, uh, because now they look like traitors, as opposed to the Hamas heroes who are fighting against Israel while Mahmoud Abbas is sitting in Ramallah doing nothing. Uh, so unfortunately and sadly, this is very, you know, Hamas will uh, paint the ceasefire as a victory. Because victory for Hamas means that they're still in power. They don't care if 5,000, 10,000 Palestinians are killed. That doesn't count. As long as Hamas remains in power after the uh, fighting, that's a victory because they say, you see, you know, we remain steadfast. We, uh, we managed to uh, survive. So that's a victory for them. Now, a victory for Hamas is bad news for President Abbas. Uh, President Abbas started this whole thing, by the way, by accusing Israel of hindering the election in Jerusalem, which was not true, by the way. And by making very serious allegations against Israel uh, about a month ago, he actually instigated the violence in Jerusalem because he put Jerusalem on the table. Mahmoud Abbas basically told the Palestinians, listen, I'm sorry, I can't hold elections because Israel doesn't want me to hold elections. Israel wants to turn Jerusalem into a Jewish city. We are facing a conspiracy. Uh, you know, this is part of the deal of the century of, you know, President Trump. Uh, Israel wants to take over our holy sites. Now, when you make such statements, what happens? People take to the streets. And this is precisely what happened in Jerusalem. But in this case, President Abbas started the fire and Hamas hijacked it and turned this so-called Jerusalem Intifada into pro-Hamas rallies. Look, I'm sure President Abbas regrets uh, having called on Palestinians to, to carry out protests in Jerusalem because the only, pro, you know, the only protests I've seen in Jerusalem are against Israel and President Abbas, right. calling him a traitor, uh, a U.S. agent, and the only flags I've seen on the streets of Jerusalem are Hamas flags. And the, the only pictures I've seen of Palestinian leaders are of those of the Hamas leaders, Khaled Mash'al, uh, Ismail Haniya. And uh, just a few days ago, I was near the uh, Temple Mount, and there were thousands of people there chanting, we are all Muhammad Dif. Muhammad Dif, the... Uh, Military commander. commander of Hamas's military wing. And, oh, beloved Hamas, bomb, bomb Tel Aviv. I didn't see one Palestinian uh, say, you know, we support President Mahmoud Abbas and we support uh, peace and I, we want... You didn't get that. Now, President Abbas is in big trouble. 
I don't even see how he can survive after this. But as long as Israel is there in the West Bank, he will survive. I mean, he will remain in power at least. But his credibility among the Palestinians has been severely undermined. Now, to follow up on what we were talking about previously, um, how is the killing of Arab Israelis and Palestinians themselves by Hamas affected public opinion in the Arab world? Which so things like rocket rockets falling short, for example, or uh, some of the rockets that have uh, made it past Iron Dome and unfortunately killed uh, some Israeli Arabs. Has, has that penetrated uh, public opinion at all in, say, uh, the the UAE or or amongst the Saudis or? Look, I mean, you know, some people. I've, I've seen some comments here and there from uh, Arabs, especially in, in the Gulf, saying, "Oh, you see." Uh, Hamas does not care about Arabs or Muslims. They fire indiscriminately into Israel. Uh, Hamas was even criticized for firing towards Jerusalem, which has a large Arab population and has the holy sites. And some people were saying, hey, you know, you could have destroyed the Al-Aqsa Mosque with your rockets. So what are you, what's going on over here? Uh, it's tragic that, you know, some of these uh, rockets that were fired by Hamas and Islamic Jihad, uh, killed uh, not only Jews, but also Arabs. Uh, they also wounded some Arabs. Uh, I didn't see any specific response from Westerners to that. I didn't really, you know, uh, but by and large, those who know Hamas, they're not surprised by this. Uh, also, I didn't see a, a very powerful reaction from the Arab community inside Israel. It's possible that people are afraid to speak out also. Uh, against Hamas, uh, you know. So th these are some of the reasons why yeah. we didn't see much of a uh, much of a uh, an uproar over the, over Hamas's uh, uh, killing of Arabs or Palestinians. Now, do you think it would be fair to say that um, Israel, the Israeli government, lacks a long term strategy in terms of dealing, um, even with what's been uh, unfolding in, say, uh, the West Bank? Uh, and uh, the strategy vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinian Authority, is there one or not? Not really. A strategy, a strategy towards the Palestinian Authority or towards Hamas or towards the Palestinians in general? All three. Look, I mean, the Israeli government or, or Israel in general, doesn't really matter who is in, uh, in power in Israel is facing two Palestinian camps. You know, the Palestinians are divided into two, into two separate camps, two mini states, we call them here. One in Gaza, led by Hamas, and the second one in the West Bank, led by uh, the Palestinian Authority. Now, some people, even in Israel, would tell you this is good for Israel. It's good that the Palestinians are divided. Uh, as long as they are killing each other and fighting each other, Fatah and Hamas, that's good for Israel. Because Israel can always say, look at these Palestinians. They can't get their act together. They cannot re reunite themselves. They cannot even agree on elections. Uh, they cannot agree. They don't even have a functioning parliament. Uh, so how can we talk about a two-state solution? when the Palestinians are divided into two separate states there that are also at war with each other. Uh, now, look, I don't know if it's true or not true, but some people in Israel would also tell you that the Israeli government uh, has an interest in keeping Hamas in power in Gaza, uh, but weakening Hamas at the same time. Why? Because as long as Hamas is in Gaza, that also serves Israel's interest of keeping the Palestinians divided. So what we are seeing right now, or what we have been seeing for the past 14 years, is an Israeli policy that says, I will work with any Palestinian who wants to work with me, and I will fire back at any Palestinian who shoots at me. And this is basically the, the Israeli strategy. But Israel should not be middling in the internal affairs of the Palestinians. But the, you know, Israel should only be looking after Israel's security. 
and Israel should be doing what is good for Israel. If the Palestinians get their act together, they stop killing each other, they reunite themselves, uh, they establish proper government, they elect new leaders, they get rid of all these, uh, you know, Abu Ammaz and Abu Ala, all these Abus sitting there in Ramallah, that's good for them. Uh, if they don't, what can Israel do? Israel cannot go to Ramallah and elect leaders for the Palestinians. So is, for now, the status quo is relatively good. I mean, until a few weeks ago, we had calm, we had stability. We knew where we, where we were standing. Israel is working in the West Bank with the Palestinian Authority. Okay, the Palestinian Authority incites against Israel, but it's also working with Israel, and that's good news for Israel, that the Palestinian Authority is working with Israel on the security level. With Hamas, you know, Israel managed to create a balance of deterrence. You, you shoot at me, I shoot back. And uh, the message that Israel has just sent so Hamas says, don't mess with us again, because we can wake up in the morning and go crazy and bomb the hell out of you. That's the message. But at the end of the day, I don't think that Israel wants to bring down Hamas. Israel wants to weaken Hamas. Israel wants to undermine Hamas. And I think that's a correct policy, by the way. Because, if, first of all, in order to bring down Hamas, you need to send the Israeli army, the IDF, into Gaza. And that's going to be very costly financially and with human lives. And Israel doesn't want to go back there. And that's good news also. Then there's another question. You go into Gaza, you, you don't know how you, how you are going to come out from Gaza. What's the exit strategy? You don't know. I mean, the last time Israel went into Gaza, it stayed there for... 30 years, 32 years, I can't remember exactly. Between 67 and 2005. Right. Now, so. yeah, there's another question which we need to take into consideration. You bring down Hamas. Who said that you are going to get something better than Hamas? You might even miss Hamas. <laughs> uh, the way things are going now in Gaza, I don't see, you know, moderate voices. I look at the alternatives to Hamas and I see that they are worse. Islamic Jihad and Al-Qaeda and uh, groups affiliated with ISIS. So Israel is probably saying, telling itself, well, you know, it's better, uh, I'd rather deal with, an, with a devil I know. <laughs> it's better than a devil I don't know. So it's not easy for Israel. There are many, many dilemmas facing Israel right now. But we need to find a way to return to calm, to stability. And uh, it's very important that, you know, this fighting ends so that Israel can focus its attention on what is happening inside Israel. With Hamas, we will have a ceasefire. And we will go back to the, uh, to the normal, uh, you know, to what we had. We, I mean, we know where we are headed with Hamas, at least for the next few years. But what do you do about relations between Jews and Israel? I'm, I'm very worried because that, I think that, that, that Hamas. Into, uh, that leads me into a question that one of our uh, one of our viewers would like answered: um, Who is orchestrating the violence in Israel in mixed communities, or do you believe it's spontaneous or both? Is is there some somebody uh, pulling those levers? Well, I, I think I think it's first of all the result of incitement by some Israeli Arab leaders. It's also the result of incitement by Hamas and the Palestinian Authority, telling Muslims, "Listen, your holy sites are at stake. They're being threatened by Israel. You need to do something about it." Uh, but I, my understanding is that there are also many people involved in violent crime in the Arab sector who, you know, are responsible for some of the uh, attacks on synagogues, on uh, Jewish homes, on uh, uh, Jewish passersby. Uh, so it's really a combination. 
uh, of all these things. Uh, I wouldn't say that there is one guy or one party sitting there directing it. Uh, some of it, by the way, could be spontaneous also. Uh, my understanding from the Israeli police is that you know they've arrested more than 1,000 Arab Israelis who were involved in the rioting, and they discovered that maybe 90% of them or 95% of them were under the age of 24. So there's a new generation over there uh, that you know needs to be dealt with. I don't know who they belong to. I haven't heard that, many, that they belong to any political, that most of them belong to political groups, by the way. And we have political groups inside Israel. In some cases, and this is also interesting, we saw that uh, the police discovered that people involved in violent crime, in you know, criminal activities in the Arab sector were also shooting at the police and involved in, the, in attacks on Jews. And why is that? I think these people found, these criminals found an opportunity to clean their name. You know, the Arab sector has been uh, suffering from an upsurge of violent crime in recent years. Uh, and these criminals who have a lot of weapons and who have been terrorizing the Arab community, uh, they saw this as an opportunity to clean their name, so to speak, to show their community that they are doing something nationalistic also, that they are not just stealing and murdering Arabs and uh, that they are also fighting against Israel. So these are all the, the factors that, uh, that you know, uh, fit into this whole thing. In recent days, uh, there has been a dramatic decline in uh, tensions between, or in violence, in violent incidents between uh, Arabs and Jews inside Israel, especially in the mixed cities, that's very good. Uh, I, th I would like to see more Jews and Arabs getting together and uh, working. We cannot allow Hamas and Iran and Mahmoud Abbas and all the extremists to damage relations between Jews and Arabs inside Israel. The vast majority of the Arabs inside Israel are loyal citizens who are, who are not involved in, in this violence, by the way, and who are even opposed to it. Yes, some of them or many of them are afraid to speak out. But I don't hear from Arab Israelis that they feel that this is, you know, the end. I'm also optimistic because, you know, I've covered many conflicts in the past. I've covered two intifadas. I've seen tensions between Arabs and Jews inside Israel. Uh, especially during the second intifada. But at the end of the day, or after a few weeks or months, when things settle down and there's quiet, we just return to normal. And uh, once again, you know, you will see Jews going to eat hummus in a, or kebab in, a, in an Arab restaurant, and you, you will see more Arabs uh, go to the shopping mall in Malha in Jerusalem, as, as was the case. But it, it will take time. It will take time. We need to stop the incitement, the indoctrination, and we need to engage with the moderate forces on both sides. I'm also optimistic because I see on social media many Jews and many Arabs getting together, saying we refuse to be enemies. Uh, you know, we condemn the violence. So you know, this is good for Israel, by the way. We have no other choice. With Hamas. We know how, you know, Israel can bomb them and Israel can uh, fire back at them. But what do you do when your own citizens uh, uh, do, do such things, you know? Uh, Israel is a country of law and order. And I say, if someone broke the law, whether he's a Jew or an Arab, I don't, you know, punish him. But don't punish, don't make generalizations and avoid collective punishment. So definitely, I think uh, what has to happen, and I... I really hope that uh, soon you will see uh, a return to normal in that respect. So what has to happen in Palestinian politics for a peace deal to take place between Israel and the Palestinians, be it Hamas, which of course that's a non-starter non right there, or be it uh, Fatah? What are the chances of those things happening? Look, if you want to make peace with Israel, 
you need to prepare your people for peace with Israel. It's as simple as that. But you cannot make peace with Israel when you are telling your people all these bad things about Israel. How can you make peace with Israel when you are delegitimizing Israel? On radio, on TV, on social media, and in the mosques. How can you make peace with Israel when you are demonizing Jews? How can you make peace with Israel when you are glorifying terrorism and violence? Does that really help raise a generation that supports uh, peace with Israel? So in order for that to happen, you need to change the narrative. You need to start working on fixing the narrative. I'm not saying that the Arabs or the Palestinians need to endorse Zionism and become pro-Israel. What I'm saying is you need to bring down the volume. You need to stop the incitement, which is poisoning the hearts and minds of millions and millions of people. Mahmoud Abbas tells the Palestinians the Jews are bad, the Israel is bad. Then when the Palestinians hear that, who are they going to vote for? They will vote for Hamas. This incitement is empowering, emboldening the radicals, the extremists. That's where they find fertile soil. So first of all, you need to work on this uh, incitement, the indoctrination, the poison. And don't tell me it's only, the, it's not, you know, people attach too much importance to the textbooks. I don't care about the textbooks as much as I care about what the parents tell their children, yeah. what the children see on the street, what, what they watch on the media. Uh, that's much more powerful. The, uh, the media, the mosque, the rhetoric of the leaders has more of an impact on the people, on the young people than the textbooks. In order for a Palestinian child to hate Israel, he doesn't necessarily have to go to school and sit in the classroom and open the history book and then say, oh my God, now I hate Israel. There are so many reasons why. So that's one way of starting it. Now, once you calm things down, you will see the emergence of new moderate leadership, pragmatic leadership. And then you hold elections. And if these moderate, pragmatic leaders come to power with a message that said that says, you know, we want peace with Israel, then we will move forward. But under the current circumstances, it is a joke to talk about any the revival of any peace process. What peace process are they talking about? And with who? With who? Is it, Israel is facing two camps. One camp does not want to deliver Hamas. And the other camp is saying, I cannot deliver, I'm too weak. One camp is saying, I want all of Israel. I want the land from the Mediterranean Sea to the Jordan River. Israel has no right to be over here. And the second camp, Mahmoud Abbas, is saying, I want 100% of what Israel took in 1967. East Jerusalem, the West Bank, Gaza. You know, and then after that, I cannot guarantee you Israel anything. So this is what Israel is facing. Right. I'd like to take it back uh, to what we were initially talking about, uh, the Abraham Accords. So is there a feeling in Israel or in the Gulf states that the current violence will lessen American support for the Abraham Accords? Is this something that they're watching to see if that'll happen? Well, people are... Over here, Arabs, Jews uh, are already worried by what they perceive as being the lack of enthusiasm on the part of the Biden administration towards the Abraham Accords. There isn't this feeling that, you know, the, a feeling of euphoria that we had under the previous administration, for example. You know, the previous administration was pushing these accords, was talking about them, was uh, talking about cooperation, economic prosperity, all these wonderful things we used to hear. We don't hear them. We're not, the people here are not hearing them from the Biden administration. And if you're not coming out with full support, 
of these agreements, that means you don't really care about them. And that's why we want to hear from this administration a, a more powerful commitment to these agreements that will encourage more Arabs to join in, that will send the right messages to the people in this region. But as I said before, many Arabs are still not certain about, you know, they don't even, they don't know yet in which direction this administration is going. So sometimes you really need to be tough and firm and bang on the table and say, you know, this is my position, I support it. But if you're going to come out with all these statements of, you know, trying to be balanced and politically correct and talking about, oh, both sides need to end the, the violence. And I mean, these, you know, these statements don't work anymore, uh, especially not on the Arabs. The Arabs are not stupid. They, the, the Arabs today understand that Iran is a threat, they understand that Hamas is a threat, they understand that Hezbollah is destroying them, they understand that the Houthis are bad. The Arab, many Arabs today understand that the real threat is the terrorists and Iran and not Israel. And that's why I would like to see this administration reach out to the Arab world, push them, use your you know, influence with them, tell them, Folks, these are wonderful accords. Let's discuss, let's find ways of expanding them. Let's, you know, create more opportunities. But we, we're not seeing that. I mean, what we are seeing is Iran trying to, uh, sorry, the U.S. administration going to appease Iran. And this appeasement is very dangerous. It sends the wrong message to moderate Arabs and uh, moderate uh, Muslims in this part of the world who feel targeted, who are being targeted, not feel, but the, who are being targeted by Iran. So, the, I mean, the administration has to decide. And one, one thing that uh, I would like to uh, bring up, and this is uh, apart from the Abraham Accords, but it um, is also, I suppose, related certainly to the subject of peace, is there's been a fire balloon attacks occurring uh, in southern Israel uh, from Gaza, and I'd like to get your thoughts on what Israel must do to stop these attacks uh, on the uh, on, on the south, which of course predated this current war by by months, by more than months, by by years, in fact. Are you talking about the rocket attacks? Of uh, uh, the the fire balloons, the the arson and the burning of uh, Dunham's in the, in the in the south. Is there what can be done to stop that? Look, the the only way to stop these is by putting pressure on Hamas. Hamas is saying, look, I'm the government. I control Gaza. So you have, a, you have an address. And you need to go to Hamas and say, look, I'm not going to allow more Qatari money to come into Gaza unless you stop this. And believe me, Hamas knows how to stop. When they want to stop someone and they want to crack down on someone who goes against their interests, they know how to do it. And they have done it in the past, by the way. So the pressure should be on those who claim that they are, you know, in the masters of Gaza, the, the rulers of Gaza. Uh, you know, <laughs> the absurd situation is that Israel has an interest in having a strong government in Gaza that Israel can hold accountable. And the only strong government over there is Hamas. You also need a strong government in Gaza so that it can enforce a ceasefire that you reach with the with Hama, with the Gaza. So that's why I keep saying it's not black and white. It's not it's not a simple situation. Don't think that Israel is uh, just, you know, uh, bombing for no reason and attacking. No, no. Israel has so many things to take into consideration. Also, the fact that Israel does not want to send a message that is fighting against the people in Gaza. This is not a war on the Palestinians in Gaza. I keep telling my foreign colleagues over here Israel, who, who tell me Israel is waging war on Gaza. I say that's not true. Israel is going after a terrorist group in Gaza. Unfortunately and sadly, civilians are being killed in the uh, process. But we all know, first of all, that you cannot go to war uh, in Gaza without killing civilians because it's a very small place. And secondly, because Hamas and all these uh, groups over there, they are sitting in the schools, in the, uh, near the hospitals. Uh, they, they fire from the uh, residential areas. And I mean, that's how it works. And Hamas 
these Hamas people, they're not walking around in uniforms also. They pretend to be civilians and they're, you know, uh, to avoid being targeted by Israel. So it's a, it's a very sad situation. But as I said, the pressure should be on those who claim that they are the government in Gaza. That's the only way to stop the balloons and not the balloons. It will never stop, you know, 100%. You will always have attacks here and there. But at least, you know, it's better than the rockets and the missiles. Thank you. Thank you, Halad. I think we're going to have to stop it there. I greatly appreciate your uh, perspective. There's some optimistic notes at a moment where that's very, very much needed and a great deal of nuance, which of course is to be expected from your fantastic reporting. Uh, so thank you for joining us. And a huge thank you to our Emmett thank members. Thank you. I appreciate it. Israel is at war right now. We're under assault from Iranian proxies on all fronts. And among those fronts is the press. We've spent this briefing discussing a tenuous peace. If a long-term peace is to be achieved, if Israel is to have the security that it deserves, we have to confront the lies about it in the press. And we can't do so without your support. And for that, we're grateful. Thank you for joining us.